final speaker has been involved in the internet and distributed computing for nearly 30 years. He has served as chief technology officer at the National Center for Supercomputing, Supercomputing Applications to direct the creation of both regional and national scale fiber optic research networks, established an international technical standards body, and is today the chief information officer at Argonne National Laboratory. His current focus areas are privacy, security, and intelligent infrastructure. I'm honored to introduce Charlie Catlett, sharing with us today his thoughts on maintaining your privacy, is it too late? I want to spend a few minutes um, with you thinking about privacy. And uh, I'm going to start with the assumption that you care about privacy. Um, and that more importantly, you care about that your understanding of your privacy matches the reality of your privacy. I don't think privacy is dead, but we have gone through a transition where we can't assume that what we're doing is necessarily preserving our privacy. So we've gone from a default situation where our activities are mostly private to a situation where our privacy needs to be managed. So I want to talk about that and what I mean by that. And then I want to fast forward a little bit and think about things just on the horizon that are a little more difficult to, uh, to grapple with in terms of privacy. So we're moving from privacy by default to privacy that we have to manage to privacy where we're not sure how to manage it. And unless we understand where we are now, we won't be able to grapple with the privacy issues that are coming right down, uh, right down the next few years. So I want to talk about technology and services. And I'll start with the PDA, the Personal Digital Assistant. Um, I carried one of these Newtons uh, about 20 years ago. And if I lost it, the consequence was that I lost some information. Today, I carry another device by Apple. It's an iPhone. I call this a personal digital augmenter because it doesn't just assist me, but it amplifies the things that I can do and the scope in which I can act. It's connected to the internet, and so that means I can broadcast video, text, pictures. I can interconnect with other people. I can work with banks and service providers to move money around and to buy things. If I lost my PDA 20 years ago, I'd mostly be worried about the value of the hardware. If I lose my iPhone today, I'm not worried about the hardware. I'm worried about the information that's on it and its ability to act as my proxy. So the first thing to keep in mind as we talk about privacy is that this device that you're carrying around, how many people are carrying some form of a smartphone? Wow, more than two thirds. Um, the first is, this is very closely tied to your personal security and privacy. So keeping it physically safe, keeping it safe from viruses, et cetera, um, keeping it private is very closely tied to keeping your own person safe and private. So that's technology, and we'll come a little bit back to that. Now I want to talk about services. So I would make the claim that we have never seen an adoption of technology like we've seen in the last five years with social networks. Why do I say that? This is a graph that shows the adoption of technology over the last century. And those little lines that you're seeing, if you can't read the text, show from the introduction of a particular technology at, at a point in time, and they track the, the adoption of that technology by the percentage of households in the US that have that particular technology. We're sort of used to adoption of technology, which means not just learning how to use that technology, but understanding its effect on our lives. We're used to that process taking decades, 30, 40 years for cars, for uh, stoves, for uh, electricity. The most rapid growth in, uh, that we've seen is the radio. That was quite a long time ago. So in the 20th century, at least with these technologies that, that are on this graph, the most rapid adoption we saw was radio, and that was about eight years. Faster than the microwave, faster than the internet, the cell phone, the computer. Now what about social networks? So about a year ago, Netpop, Netpop Research is uh, who, who did this data. About a year ago, there were uh, 138 million broadband users in the US. The question is how many of those a year ago were using social networks by the definition of this list on the left? Well, on a regular daily basis, about 40 million were using social networks a year ago. And about 105 million were casually using social networks. 
So it's hard to look at this data on about the fifth birthday of Facebook and not say that social networks have penetrated way more than 50% of US households. So we have ubiquitous smartphones that are internet connected and that are able to act as sensors and trackers. And we have social network services that have swept through the nation and actually the civilized world in a very short amount of time. And we as humans are used to dealing with things that grow linearly, not exponentially. We're used to change that happens over a long period of time, not a very short period of time. So it's important that we understand the implication of social networks and these devices on our privacy today because that picture is going to look too, uh, very different in two or three years. So here's my uh, iPhone when I first started using social networks from the iPhone. A very simple picture here. Uh, the blue lines are things that I do. I push some information out. It's an act that I take. The red lines are automatic updates or synchronization. So very simple picture, Facebook, Twitter, uh, something called TripIt that I use to manage my, uh, my travel and put it onto my calendar, which I subscribe to from my iPhone. I started experimenting around with putting pictures out. Uh, one of the first location-based services, I could tell my friends where I'm at and update my location on Twitter. Uh, started looking at, well, if I post slides or pictures to the internet, maybe my friends will want to know. So I connected these things to, uh, to friend feed. Got into posting video and collections of pictures using a couple more services, and more recently, uh, the big craze is uh, location-based social networks. And uh, the popular ones are Foursquare and Gowalla. And I've added a new color of uh, line on here, yellow, which says it's a selective, uh, selective transfer of information. So I can update just my friends that I'm here at Wentz Hall. I can update my friends on Gowalla or Foursquare. I can say, well, I want more people to know, so I'll update my 400 friends on Facebook and I can decide whether to do that or not. Or I can say, well, let the world know that I'm giving a talk at TEDx Naperville and send it out to Twitter. So I've got some control over how I'm sharing my information. But you've noticed here, I'm, I probably shouldn't ask this question, but how many people are, are connected with this many social networks? I'm just trying to figure out how weird I am. OK, one or two of you. <laughs> so here's where it gets dangerous and why I say privacy is something we have to manage explicitly. There's a lot that's happening here, and it's a lot to keep track of. And there's no application or service out there. There's no app for that when it comes to map all my social connections. I've got to keep track of these things. But the problem is, over time, I stop using something. So the ones that are fading out are the ones I'm not using anymore. But the connections are still there unless I explicitly turn them off. In most cases, I haven't explicitly turned them off. So I, you know, I'm still posting to friend feed, even though I never log in there and look at it. So if I'm not proactive about managing my privacy, because I'm adding these things one thing at a time, and trust me, eventually you will too, um, then my privacy will no longer be easily manageable. So as I said, we're in this period of time now where privacy is not gone. It's still important, but it's not default anymore. A couple other things about these smartphones, these devices. So, so um, of course, they know where you are. The phone knows where, it, where you are, and your carrier knows where you are. And, and when you sign your agreement with your carrier, you also agreed to them being able to track where you are and track other pieces of information off of your machine, like applications that you use and times applications crash and things like that. Many applications are now asking, can we use your current location? OK. I want to use the application, so I say OK. And I'm in the habit of now saying, OK, you can use my location, but it's not clear from just the screen how long are they going to use it. Are they going to give it to anyone? Are they going to keep it private? Am I giving it up for good? Uh, can I go back and delete that information or, re or take it back? Um, is this company my friend? They say, welcome friend. Um, but <laughs> they're more concerned with their company and not primarily with my privacy or security. And if they're using my location information, how often are they getting my location information? Um, and does this mean that they're putting together, because they're keeping it, a trail of where I've been, which is a lot more information about me than where I am at a particular point in time. Um, this is kind of a fun picture of my favorite cafe in Rome. Um, it's right bet it's, uh, in between the Pantheon and Piazza Navona. I highly recommend it. Um, my friend took my picture here, and later we, we looked at the guy in the background and we're like, that guy looks familiar. 
That's the, that's the subway ghost from the movie Ghost. You sure? I mean, yeah, we found the picture of him, and he's even wearing the same hat. <laughs> so we've geolocated this guy, Vincent Schiavelli. He's dead now. He wasn't dead then. But we've geolocated him, and we've, so we've said, well, he's at this place at this time, because the picture has got a timestamp in it, not on the screen, but in the, in the photo file. Well, he's kind of used to that, or was, because he's a public figure. I'm not used to being geolocated, and I'm not sure that I really want to be all the time geolocated um, by other people. Now, hold that thought. Um, how many folks have played around with or understand what I mean when I say augmented reality applications? Good number. So this phone knows where I am. It also knows that it's pointing up, and it knows that it's pointing north. And so that means that what I see through the screen, if I turn the camera on, because the application knows where it's pointed and where it is, can superimpose information on that screen, like points of interest that are in that direction from me, or maybe my friends who are over there. Right? John is 100 feet in that direction. right? This is a very interesting application called Recognizer. And you say, I want to recognize a person. And so I hit Recognize, and then I turn it toward the person that sees their face. And then it goes and looks and does facial recognition, pulls up all their social network profiles. That's a little bit unnerving. Is anyone else unnerved by that? <laughs> well, this particular service, uh, you have to opt in. But that's only because the people that did the service decided to do it that way. There's no technical reason why anyone couldn't do a service like this that goes out and gets public information about us and profiles us. Now, I took this picture a few years later in Rome. Um, and this was a big crowd, obviously. Uh, and I, I, I went through manually, and uh, this is what I do on airplanes. Uh, and I, I looked and I said, well, 25 of these faces, my, my facial recognition on my laptop in an iPhoto could recognize those faces. Um, with a little bit of a better facial recognition algorithm, another 75 would be recognizable. And with maybe better resolution and a better algorithm, another 120. And if I went from a 6 megapixel camera to, say, a 50 megapixel camera, which is maybe a few years away, then thousands of people can be geolocated just because I took a picture of a crowd and posted it to Flickr. And I didn't ask any of them if that was OK. And it's not really clear what that means for us as a society, um, that this can be done. It's also not clear how to manage that. So I, I don't have an answer to that. That's what I want you to think about. Uh, Jonathan Zittrain wrote a very interesting book called The Future of the Internet and How to Prevent It. It's not primarily about uh, privacy. It's about some other interesting things. But one of the things that he does talk about in the context of privacy is this notion of uh, crowdsourced rating. When I go onto Amazon or eBay, I look at two ratings that are crowdsourced, done by the crowd, right? One is, is this vendor reliable? Is this service provider reliable? The other is, is this product any good? And I can do that because it's a very constrained situation, and those vendors and those product uh, Providers have opted in to being rated by the crowd. Well, Zitrain tells the uh, possibility of maybe we should apply this to real life or what would happen if we did. How many people would love to have this application, the bad driver application? <laughs> so, you know, I'd like to have this application, but most of the time I want to use it when I see somebody using their phone when they're driving, except for then it's a little hypocritical for me to pull this out and use my phone to rate them for using their phone while they're driving. So I've, we've taken a capability that's very interesting, but we've taken it way outside of where it began. And now the parameters are quite different. So um, that person driving that car didn't agree to, to be rated. And if I'm driving that car, I'm not sure I want to be rated because although I don't have any bumper stickers, well, I do. It's a Illini bumper sticker, which I'm sad to admit after last night. Um, I, I don't know if I'm being rated because of my driving or because you don't like my bumper sticker. So, it's not clear what this, really, what, what this really means, but it does have an impact on me as a person if we start seeing services that come up like this. You heard a talk about RFID. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but my bank did not tell me that this ATM card had an RFID chip in it. And so I keep it in this envelope, this uh, foil envelope. Same thing with your new passports, RFID chip in it. And the reason I do is because for 50 bucks at Fry's, 
can get the parts to get an RFID reader that will work from th three feet away. How many people are carrying one of those? One, one, two, okay. So it's not a big danger. You might think this is paranoid, but two, three years from now, you can guarantee there's an app for that. <laughs> now, we're also seeing in the medical community uh, use of technology, advance of technology to do medical monitoring. I would love to have this contact lens, if I could get past the, I don't want to wear a contact lens, but I'd love to have a, a sensor that would tell me all the time what's my glucose level, what's my blood pressure, and how's my cholesterol doing. I would, I, that would be a great thing, especially if it's really cheap. But I'm not going to wear a bunch of wires. These things are going to talk with wireless networks. What I don't want is to wear this contact lens in a business negotiation where the people on the other side of the table know my blood pressure. <laughs> so, as I said at the beginning, we're in a period of time right now where we have to actively manage our privacy. Some of these examples that I've used, I'm not sure what the answer is to preserve our privacy moving forward. It's some combination of technology and policy, um, if that's even the answer. But we do have some signs of paradigms and architectures that we might be able to extend into the future if we care enough to think about it. And, and one of them is we're training right now, or possibly, possibly training, we have the opportunity to train 400 million people on privacy because there are at least that many people in Facebook. And Facebook, despite uh, a few missteps in terms of privacy, they give some really powerful pri privacy tools to us. I can, I can post a picture and only have it be seen by three of my friends. I can put parts of my profile uh, so only a few of my friends can, can see them. But to translate this into this electronic world, the world that I've been talking about, I might also want to say delete the last day of my location history, delete all of my location history, or better yet, I want to control the use of my location information and, and put some rules around how that can be used. There's two ways to do that. One is we can come up with technology that doesn't exist, which wraps around my data and, and uh, uh, ensures that it gets used the right way. And if we had that technology, then we would use it for DVDs and movies and music. We don't. Another way to do it is would be to use a proxy. And I only work then, I would only use applications that respected my privacy enough to use a proxy to keep my data. And the major point being, it's my data. So we got to manage our privacy. As we move forward, it'll be much more hard, much more difficult to manage our privacy. I'll just leave you with uh, this thought here that uh, as we move forward, got to manage it. And our privacy is impacted really more by all of your smartphones than my smartphone or my bank uh, or some government. Thank you very much.